Good evening to a week in politics in which the parties hired men to run around the country in fancy dress, pecking at each other for the cameras. Yes, Tony Blair, John Major and Paddy Ashdown went on tour. And with sleaze still thrusting itself onto the political agenda, just how low can you, the voter, sink in the estimation of your MP? We have an exclusive poll. It's been a mixed campaign week for all the parties. Labour has tartan troubles, the Tories still have tatten troubles, and the Liberal Democrats would like to have some troubles if only to make us notice them. Well, I'm joined in the studio by Labour's Alistair Darling, Malcolm Bruce for the Liberal Democrats, and for the Conservatives, Michael Jack. Uh, Michael Jack, uh, let's turn to your tatten troubles. Uh, a poll in the Observer newspaper to be published tomorrow morning will say that you will lose the seat in tatten if Neil Hamilton doesn't stand down as your candidate. The treasurer of his own constituents constituency association says he should go. Why do you think he should remain as a Conservative candidate there? I think that that is a matter for the Tatton Conservative Association. They'll no doubt take into account all the information that's available to them. As far as a national view of that is concerned, I think the Prime Minister showed earlier this week he was quite prepared to take all the questions on that, and it's a question as he made it very clear that a man is innocent until proven guilty. But it guilty. matters to more than just Conservatives in Tatton. You're going to lose one of your safest seats in the country, and the evidence is the sleaze is being spread out from there, endangering other seats. Why should you, Michael Jack, risk losing your seat in the House of Commons because of the behaviour of Neil Hamilton? Because I see that the Prime Minister has faced this whole question fair and square. He made himself available at the beginning of this week to intensive press questioning. He gave a very full and frank expose of our position on that, and he made it very clear, certainly as far as Mr Hamilton was concerned, that he was innocent until, pro until proven guilty. He also made it right. very clear that these are decisions for the Tatton Conservative Association as far as their candidates are concerned, and that's the way it should be. All right, let's turn to you, Alistair Darling, because most of uh, your troubles have revolved around Tony Blair's performance in Scotland. Now, many people have written this up as a blunder. Down in London, however, his spin doctors tell us that no, it was all part of a master plan. He deliberately wanted to humiliate and enrage the Scottish Labour Party to win votes in Middle England. As a Scottish MP, that must make you feel pretty used and sore, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, just having come down from up in Scotland, as you put it, yes. uh, I can assure That's you... That's it, down that, in uh, London. I, I can assure you it doesn't look like that there. No, what, our, po our policy has been clear for a long, long time, that we intend to legislate to set up a Scottish Parliament, uh, and uh, that has never changed. What is also absolutely clear is that we have given a commitment uh, not to increase the top uh, or the basic rate of uh, taxation for the next Parliament. That mm -hmm. commitment holds true north and south of the border. This is one of these rows that you get in elections. You know, the Tories will have this sort of trouble in the next few days. We get it from time well, to time when people simply blow things out. It's a bit more, more than one of these rows. I mean, how, how solid is Tony Blair's commitment to devolution and decentralisation when he says, yes, Scotland can have a Parliament, <coughs> but I'm king, I'm sovereign, his words, I will veto any attempt for them to use these tax-raising powers. No, what, what we've said is that we're going to legislate to sket, set up a Scottish Parliament. That commitment is absolute, it's been there for many, many years, and we'll deliver on it. What is equally clear that the Labour Party, north and south of the border, is also giving a commitment to the electorate at this general election, and that is that we won't increase the top and basic right. rate of tax north or south of the border. It's absolutely clear, and indeed the Labour Party, I mean, it's very nice of you to, uh, to, to or for commentators to somehow think they're feeling sorry for the Scottish Labour Party, the Labour Party, north and south of the border, voted 95% overwhelmingly to endorse our manifesto and so our contract with the people of this country is absolutely clear on both those matters there is no deviation whatsoever right so Malcolm Bruce uh, you you in the Liberal Democrats um, you'd be happy to cooperate still with the Labour government on constitutional constitutional matters will you after that well we recognize that constitutional issues have been notoriously difficult in the past which is why we had uh, a long period of negotiation over six years in the Constitutional Convention in Scotland to get agreement and the agreement on what we're going to implement uh, in the next Parliament is in both the Labour and the Conservative okay. and the Liberal Democrat Manifesto. Okay. And that obviously is what we want to implement. Let's look at your problem. <coughs> You've said we're the only party being honest with the voters in this campaign. The voters are being pretty honest with you. Most of them are saying a huge majority that they don't want to vote for you in a, a poll, a Mori poll tomorrow. You've got 9% support, well, half what you well, achieved at the last election. Your campaign's going completely wrong, isn't well, it? I don't think it is. I mean, first of all, the, the feedback we're getting on the ground is very much more positive than that, and the election is nearly four weeks away. Our manifesto was only published yesterday. So I don't see how the voters can firmly have made up their mind, and something like 30% have said they haven't made up their mind. What we're saying to people is, look, 
if you agree with us that there's a problem yeah. in the health service and a problem in education and money is needed for that, we're the only party that's actually committed to doing but something. But look, help like me out. I've got confused by Paddy Ashton's strategy. I thought <coughs> equidistance had been abandoned, that you said clearly you wouldn't support the Conservatives in government, but you might cooperate with Labour. Now you're going back to the ba bad old game of bashing both sides. No, we're not in the business of bashing at both sides. We're offering a constructive and distinctive alternative. What we want to make absolutely clear to people is we would not under any circumstances put a discredited Conservative government that couldn't win a majority back into power. But nor okay. are we in the business of being, as I think Richard Holm put it, the fifth wheel on Labour's caravan. Okay. We are fighting our own campaign. OK, thank you all for the moment, but please stay there, gentlemen, because we want to invite our audience from Corby to interrogate you a bit later in the programme. Now, have this week's manifestos, how have they gone down in Downing Street? Here's episode four of our everyday tale of Chippenham folk. My name's Kevin Dawson. I work at Halfords as a supervisor on the Parts Department. The last election I voted Conservative for the first time. I'm undecided on who to vote for, mainly because there's no one party that can say, well, this is what we will do for myself and the, the country. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'd like a copy of the Conservative Manifesto, please. That one right here. Okay, that's excellent. There you go. Thank you. Good reading. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. When I read the manifestos, I would expect to find some concrete ideas as to what each party has visions of for the future. If that is the case, then yes, maybe they will actually sway me one way or the other. But at the moment, you know, until I actually read them, I can't say. My name's Andrea Wilkinson. I've mostly voted Conservative. The last election, I voted Liberal Democrat, um, and, and that's what I intend to do this time as well. I don't feel a feel-good factor in my personal life um, and I don't sense it from a lot of people around me. I have had the chance to look at the Liberal Democrat um, manifesto this afternoon and it's the only document actually out of all three that I can say they've actually given specific ways in which they intend to improve all areas of society. I've read the uh, manifestos now, they're uh, <laughs> pretty much all the same really. The Liberal Democrats have said they're going to put one pence on the, the rate of tax to cover uh, funded in education. Um, nice idea, but obviously I can't see them forming a government to actually put that into practice. Labour in their uh, manifesto here, they've uh, promised uh, no increase on income tax rates for the next, well, come, uh, next years of the government, however long that may be. Um, I like the idea of that. that that's, that's at least a firm promise. Um, but what they haven't said was uh, how any indirect taxation. The Tories, um, they've promised again not to raise the basic level of income tax. In fact, they're trying to reduce it down to 20 pence. But again, how are they going to pay for it? Will it be indirectly? Hi there. Hi there. How are you doing? That's about Hello. yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Well, 30p, please. Yeah. Oh. There you go. You've had a chance to have a look at all these uh, various things now that they've been pumping out. Have you got any uh, opinions on where we're going to go in the next few weeks? I'm still undecided as to which way to go because whichever way you go, it's like they've probably what well, they promise one thing, and they'll probably deliver another one. Yeah, I mean, I think they can all be a bit um, on that. I mean, all parties. I mean, I think they tend to be a little bit vague sometimes. I mean, they sort of let us know what they want us to know. But I mean, as regards to the Labour, I don't know. I mean, it, my worry is is where. Is it where they're going to pay for it, how, how they're going to pay for it, or how same are we same, going to pay for it? Yeah. Same, same with the Conservatives, because they said they want to bring down to the 20p tax fund, don't they? Get taxes yeah, down yeah. to 20p. But they're still going to look at uh, how, they, how, they, how are they going to pay for those. My feeling is that they're going to uh, increase VAT somewhere along the line in the next five years. I reckon VAT will go up. I can't see them doing that. You don't? No. Time will tell. Anyway, gotta go. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Bye-bye. I really do think it's going to be actually on the day and then spend probably an hour before I actually go down to vote and say, right, this is who I'm going to go vote for. Yeah, I'm French guy now. I've got mixed feelings about the manifesto um, of any party because I don't think many of them actually 
hold true to the word. It's, it's almost like a selling tool, isn't it, yeah. for their party? Obviously, this is this is the bump of what they say they're going to do. This holds all the promises in these 40, 50 pages or whatever. What I find rather strange is both of the, both Labour and the Conservatives say they're going to put taxes down, and yet all the economic experts say there's no way that they can actually do that, and it is just a ploy to win voters. Mm. And after the election is all, all over, then the taxes will have to rise in order to pay for everything. I get the feeling, really, that you know, they, they have it. Gordon Brown's got a definite plan of where he's going to pay for um, these tax cuts. I, I think he has got a definite plan, but he's reluctant to. Um, yeah. let the cat out of the bag. I mean, I will probably vote Liberal Democrat because, like Andrea, um, I mean, although I believe with, in their policies anyway, I don't, want, I don't want the Tories to get in again if I can help it. And a, a Liberal Democrat in Parliament, to me, would be better than a, than a Conservative person in Parliament. Yes, yes. I agree completely because I, I would vote Labour. And although I'm still undecided at the moment, I'm moving more towards me, um, voting tactically because I want a change of government. Will Anne swap a long-standing relationship with Labour for a tactical one-night stand with the Liberal Democrats? How will her husband Adrian react to her political infidelity? And will Kevin ever get serious with any of the parties? Find out in the next episode of Downing Street. Well, what does Moscow Centre make of the British election? Find out after this short break. <music> campaign, we are inviting foreign correspondents to show us their election photo diary. Here's Alexander Siznev, London Deputy Bureau Chief for the Russian news agency Ita Tas. In 1995, I was approached by the Kremlin and asked to devise an election strategy for Boris Yeltsin for his presidential campaign when he was 30 points behind in the polls. It was a challenge I took on and Boris Yeltsin went on to win the presidency with a substantial majority. So I went to the Conservative Manifesto launch to see whether John Major could follow in Yeltsin's footsteps. I suddenly found myself wondering whether the low-key approach of Mr. Major at the press conference was enough to win back the votes. The answer would be no. He looked tired, worn out. Even the majority of questions asked were boring. There was nothing to light up the imagination. Strange if you consider that the Conservatives are trailing Labour by some 20 points. Gentleman at the back. Yeah. That's me. Uh, Prime Minister, Russian news agency, Tartas, uh, Alexander Sisnev. I would like to ask you, it's, it's a bit uh, strange for us outside observers that you are actually uh, running a country with a booming economy and yet you still have to fight for your survival. What's uh, happening? We don't understand. <laughs> I've always been a great admirer of the logic and stoicism of the Russian nation, but never... <laughs> John Major had no real answer to my question. We would have staged the manifesto launch differently. The message would have been much clearer and the document itself would have contained more dramatic proposals. It would have been a team job and not a performance by one lonely prime minister with his cabinet colleagues demoted to the school bench. I think the Tories have failed to get an effective message across to the voters. What were the demon eyes of Tony Blair supposed to say exactly? Nothing much to win back votes. The Tories should have been saying right from the start that Labour, like any other socialist party, has changed its colours only for as long as it takes to confuse the voters and gain power before reverting back to its old habits. New Labour, all danger, they should have said. John Major probably thinks he's having a tough time, but unlike Yeltsin, his heart is in good condition and he has no war with tens of thousands dead, like in Chechnya. Major seems to be throwing the election away. Mr. Major, I'm available. Word reaches us of an interesting development in Cyprus. British Forces Television, under popular pressure, has agreed to scramble its signal. Thus, the local population will be unable to get news in English about the election. I really shouldn't be telling you this. It might give you ideas. Here's Andrew. As you'd expect, one of the party manifestos published this week is packed with glossy pictures of happy, well-fed, prosperous folk living in a contented, pleasant land. The surprise is that it's the manifesto with Tony Blair's face on the front cover. Labour manifestos used to paint a picture of a joyless people writhing under the heel of those wicked Tories. But Tony Blair is determined to think positive, even about 18 years of Conservative government. 
Explicitly, you have accepted that the Conservatives got some things right. Um, you've also accepted many of the reforms that the Labour Party once opposed. The implication of that is that you're saying Labour deserved to lose the last four elections. Are you glad Labour lost the last four elections? Uh, no, not at all. Of course not. Uh, I worked very hard to make sure that we won. But I think what is sensible is to understand the reasons why the public rejected us. You'd also expect one of the manifestos to claim that, after 18 years of Tory government, Britain could be a whole lot better. The odd thing is that it's this one. This is what it says. Our goal must be for Britain to be the best place in the world to live. Where in the world at the moment is a better place to live? And will you be off there if you lose the election? Well, I'm very lucky to be able to assure you that I'm not off anywhere because we're going to win the election and I shall therefore be able to make this place not only the best, but an even better best than it already is. <laughs> the Liberal Democrats stuck to their traditional campaign tactics of claiming to be distinctive and positive. Paddy Ashton would never stoop to cheap stunts bashing the other party leaders. Would he? No, we'll do it first. No, we'll make life better. If Tony Blair is Punch and mm. John Major is Judy, what role has Paddy got? The policeman, the crocodile, or the string of sausages? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked that, Vincent. The policeman, of course. Confused by all this political cross-dressing, you're not alone. It's baffling some veterans of the campaign trail. Now that New Labour has become old Tory, could you blame socialists for voting Liberal Democrat? Uh, no, I think the vast majority of people who have traditionally voted Labour have been crying out for years and years for a sensible modern Labour Party. The political world really has turned upside down. In this election, it's the journalists who are trying to encourage the politicians to look on the bright side, even of their opponents. Could John Major find one positive thing to say about Mr Blair's manifesto? Well, I think all it shows is that Tony can do joined up handwriting. And Mr Blair speaks just as warmly of you, Prime Minister. What about those nice Liberal Democrats? Surely campaign manager Richard Holm could find it somewhere in his heart to praise something about Labour. I think I already said an answer to an earlier question, that I think it is a very great step forward for the Labour Party and the country. It's terribly grudging. It, well, um, well, I don't quite know how enthusiastic you'd like me to be. Let me say smile it again. and say, a, a well very, done. Oh, fine, with a smile. Uh, it's a very great uh, step forward uh, for uh, the uh, Labour uh, Party uh, and the country. One more time. Uh, <laughs> I think that's probably enough. More than enough, thank you. Well, after their triumph in the 1992 general election, predicting victory for Prime Minister-to-be Neil Kinnock, the pollsters are back hogging the headlines. But the fact is, the big four, Maury, Harris, ICM and Gallup, have been asking the wrong questions of the wrong people. They will insist on talking to the voters. A week in politics has been quizzing the parliamentary candidates themselves. Here's Professor Anthony King with the results. For a Week in Politics exclusive poll, we asked 205 Westminster hopefuls some probing questions. First, we asked them how many hands they've shaken since the start of electoral hostilities. In a poor third place are the non-tactile Liberal Democrat candidates, only 42% of whom have shaken more than 100 hands, while 13% admit to not having grasped a single sweaty palm. In second place, 69% of the Tories have scored a century, though one Conservative candidate declared he only ever grips the voters firmly by the throat. The winner was Labour, with a massive 81%, with one touchy-feely, thrusting young Blairite having claimed to have shaken more than 10,000 hands. We then asked the candidates whether, if elected, they'd be financially better off on an MP's salary of £43,000. Brown envelopes, of course, strictly excluded. The Tories are easily the richest, with only 26% looking forward to a pay rise, while 47% of Labour candidates could be cashing in. Among the poverty-stricken Liberal Democrats, 63% would find themselves in a higher tax bracket. Thank you very much. Asking the candidates about the hazards of canvassing, we found that while only 7% of Tory and 8% of Liberal Democrat candidates have actually been mistaken for a Jehovah's Witness, a huge 13% of Labour candidates have. It must be all those new Labour New Testament leaflets. And one Tory told us he could have sold hundreds of new patios, as most voters confuse Conservative with Conservatory. 
Next, we asked the candidates how they felt about us, the voters. Just 64% of Liberal Democrats felt we were fairly well informed about election issues, compared to 81% of Labour candidates and 84% of Conservatives. Finally, we asked the candidates whether they thought the voters were actually interested in the election campaign. A mere 24% of Labour candidates and 28% of Liberal Democrats were in touch with their electorate enough to notice that they were totally bored with the whole thing. But we must congratulate the Tories. No fewer than 36% of them can claim to be truly in touch with the voters' mood. Perhaps it's because they know who's to blame for this unprecedented six-week campaign. Now we know what the politicians think about you. After the break, it's a chance for the voters of Corby to tell the politicians what they think of them. Welcome back. After two weeks of brown envelopes and frolics in South London parks, other election issues have made an appearance. At last, we hear talk of that old election favourite, the economy. We've been to Corby in Northamptonshire, the seventh most marginal Tory seat in the country, and one of the battlegrounds that will decide this election. We spent a day at Premier Python Products, a company that makes pipes for drinks dispensers. It's a family firm with 57 employees, and questions about job security, trade unions, the windfall tax, the single currency, and a minimum wage are all being thrashed out amongst the workforce. Good afternoon, Premier Python Products. Times are good at Premier Python. The order book is full and the factory is running 24 hours a day to meet demand. But there's a problem with absenteeism. Wages start at around £4 an hour here, and in an area with low unemployment, it's not always easy to retain unskilled workers. Some on the shop floor believe that a minimum wage would help build loyalty. I think if they give everybody a... a, a it's working them long hours, a, a fair wage. You know, a, a take-home wage. I don't think it'll cost jobs or, or eat into profits. Um, what we need is a good labour force that want to turn up for work on time and get, have the benefits of a slightly better wage and the benefits of the company. Somebody's got to pay for it. And obviously the companies, if they're paying an individual more money, they've got to, get, they've got to save that money from somewhere else. And they'll get rid of, possibly get rid of non-essential staff, which could include me. Premier Python has seen 10 years of rapid growth, but in Corby, the fear of unemployment lingers. Some of these were among the 6,000 made redundant when the steelworks closed in 1980. No wonder job security is a worry. A few times I've been made redundant, and on a numerous, at least four occasions, I've had to pick up sticks and move on. I don't really think anybody's job is secure. I mean, I've been in a position where I thought my job was secure, and it hasn't been. One answer could be to start up a trade union. We will achieve uh, better working conditions for the members. Uh, I, I don't think it will go back to the, what it was the 60s and the 70s. I mean, that was just, that was madness as far as I, I was concerned. I think I would be concerned if Labour got in, that the, um, there would be the unions, there would be more... Um, red tape, if you like. The unions, years ago, had too much power. They actually closed, in my opinion, they actually closed the British Steel Corporation in the town. This is an energy-intensive business. The company spends £4,000 a year on water bills and £130,000 on electricity. A windfall tax is not a winner with managers, but there's opposition on the shop floor as well. As I have shares in the privatised industries, it will initially come out of my pocket. I'm going to lose uh, profits at the end of the years uh, and my share value is going to go down. With over 65% of their products exported, the company's future growth depends on Europe. But no party will guarantee the one thing that could help this company most, a single currency. That I think will be of great benefit. Um, we have over the last year gone through um, traumatic times with the, the pound sterling increasing in value against the European currencies. We're trading all over the world, and therefore I think it would be an advantage to us. For this company, the Tory years have been good ones, but Corby as a whole has in the past suffered as badly as anywhere. Politicians of all parties earn little thanks from the voters here, and even less trust. 
if this is a feel-good factor, I think as Mr. Clark would say, I'm further sorry, but I, I must have missed the bus. Joining me now are a group of people from Python Products in Corby, and they're going to put questions to our three guests, Alistair Darling, Malcolm Bruce, and Michael Jack. Eamon McGinley, we heard you there last on the film talking about the feel-good factor. Put it now to Michael Jack. What do you want to say? Well, that's what Mr. Jack's, as Mr. Clark says, this country's booming. We are in the middle of a feel-good factor. And as you heard me saying, I've missed it somewhere along the line. I don't understand how Mr. Clark comes to this this conclusion. At grassroots level, I don't think he, he or Mr. Major understand how hard it is to get by, make ends meet on a single wage for the family to bring up. Michael Jack. Well, I think we do, because that feel-good factor is represented by the fact that since the last election, a man on average earnings, average wage, uh, has in fact seen £1,100 a year better off in real terms, that we now face a situation of the best inflation record for nearly 50 years. We're now with the tax cuts coming in to the lowest basic rate of tax for some 60 years. In Corby, a third reduction in unemployment. Those are the factors that are contributing to making feel better. And Michael, those are just statistics you're more... throwing at him. Tell him how he should feel good, not recite him statistics. I, I would say to you that if you're buying your own home, for example, in terms of inflation and being able to have lower interest rates, we've taken something like £150 a month off the expense of the average mortgage. That's put real money back into people's pockets. That's increased spending power together with the higher living standards that our tax okay, cuts. Okay, but are you happy with that answer? Tax cuts since well, the last not at all. Two okay, Michael, hang on a sec. Please stop the flow I for a second. I only wish I could afford a mortgage. On my earnings, I'm lucky if I can afford to meet my rent. Let's go to Maddie Brown. How has uh, the feel-good factor affected you? Of course, you're in management. Yes, well, I, d I think we've all benefited. I think we do have a feel-good factor. Premier Pythons has been able to grow through a recession. We're supplying all over the world. We've been able to open a plant in America and a plant in Australia. And Corby Workforce is behind that. And I'd, like, that Labour I'd, I'd really like Mr. Darling to actually tell me that if the Labour got in, that they wouldn't spoil all that. No, you, you're spoiled sport, Alistair Darling. Here's a successful <laughs> company, well. 57 employees expanding, and she's worried that you may ruin it. Well, your company is an example of many in this country that are doing very well at the moment. And our objective must be to ensure that we have as many other companies doing well as, as, as possible. Now, I think, you know, the root of the first question uh, is, you know, the feel-good factor and why so many people don't actually notice it. And I do think there is a problem uh, when the Tories are putting posters around the country saying Britain is booming. There's two problems. One is that many people don't feel that way. And secondly, many people remember the last time we had a boom, it was followed by a Tory bust. Matt, do you I think, feel... Well, can I just finish this point, Vincent, and then by all means... Um, uh, I, I, well, I'll you've just taken back. up ten extra seconds. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Malcolm Bruce then. Malcolm, nobody's going to be very... Hang on a minute, Alistair. You've got to let the people speak. Uh, Malcolm, nobody's going to feel very good by paying the extra taxes that you say. Well, we, we accept that people would rather not pay taxes, but they would also rather not see class sizes expanding, schools closing, hospital wards shutting down, and the health service in crisis. And I think what we're saying to people is, if you are concerned about <coughs> that, and you want something done about it, don't be kidded into the idea that it can be done without money. It's not just about money, and we feel it's more sensible to say to people, we'll find the money and tell them exactly where now, and what it will cost them. Now, does that impress you, Maddie? I mean, Alistair Darling, he can come back again in a second, but he, he makes the point that people aren't feeling good, and Malcolm Bruce said they'd rather spend a bit more to be sure of getting good education. What well, do you say? he said they'd find the money. I'd like to know where you would find the money. Well, you we said it quite We'd all like to find some money. Premier Pythons would love to find some money right. that we can give our workforce more money. But Chas so a penny on the standard rate of income tax would find the money. All right, Chas Wilson, <laughs> you're concerned so. about taxes. You have a particular problem. We saw you in the film going on about your shares. That's right. You're um, an investor now, are you? We've heard from Labour over the last couple of days, or weeks in fact, about this windfall tax that they're planning on bringing in. Now, uh, I'd like Alistair to uh, say to me that that was not going to affect me. And it, like hundreds of thousands of voters, I took part in nationalised industry share options, and what's, what's he now going to do to me? It's a problem, isn't it, Alistair? The punters but actually bought the shares. Savings. Yes, uh, let me ex explain the rationale behind uh, our proposal. Uh, many of the privatised utilities were sold off at a knockdown price and have made huge windfall profits. Now, we believe that it is entirely justified uh, to have this one-off levy 
to fund the programme to get young people in the long term unemployed back to work. Incidentally, that will benefit you in that one of the reasons that tax has gone up so much over the last few years is because of the high bills that we're paying for unemployment. If we can get people off benefit, off the dole, back into work, you as a taxpayer will benefit. But looking specifically at, at, at your dividends, uh, one of the things that is becoming more and more clear is that we announced this tax in 1992. It has been discounted in share price. Uh, many companies are increasingly saying they can maintain their dividend payments and they will not have to increase their prices. Many of these companies were very, very cash rich. That's why you're seeing the spate of takeovers just now, because they are so cash rich. Now, when you look at the benefits that will come to the country and therefore you as an individual in reducing the amount of tax you have to pay because of high levels of unemployment, as well as the social and economic benefits generally, I think it's wholly justified. But, right, Chaz? But surely by uh, stopping a company's profits or taking part of a company's profits, you're actually going to be putting men on the dole and not okay, keeping I, them I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. and I, I, don't, I don't think the evidence increasingly is that that is not the case. Quick comment from, from Malcolm. Well, I think a windfall tax is a, is a, a very inadequate fig leaf. First of all, a one-off tax for one year doesn't fund the whole Parliament's programme. And it's not possible to take billions out of the utilities now that the windfall's been made without hitting either jobs or prices or having some other adverse effect. Peter Element, what's your feeling about taxation for Michael Jack before we bring him in? Well, I'm a bit concerned about the fat cats who've uh, made a lot of money out of uh, privatisation. Uh, members of the board of the privatised utilities <coughs> in particular have made millions. Why don't we tax them with a windfall tax as well? Michael, Michael those people who are the higher rate taxpayers, some of the ones that you mentioned in your question, are already making a greater contribution than they ever were to paying their taxes towards the national cake. But the key thing is how do we run these uh, utilities efficiently? And what we've just heard from Alistair Darling is effectively a dawn raid of billions of pounds of extra tax on these companies. Our questioner before put his finger on who pays? It's the shareholders of pay, it's the people who've got to pay higher prices. And as for where the money is going, it is a make-work scheme. These are not going to be people who are into long-term jobs. It's only the success of companies like yours that creates real long-term jobs, which is the way that the economy should be going. Quick comment, yes. Minister. But in 1981, the Tories introduced a windfall tax on the banks without telling anyone they were going to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that didn't affect their performance. The second thing is getting people into work, giving them an educational opportunity, must be good for this country. We're actually seeing skill shortages in some areas and get, making sure that people get opportunity must be a good thing to do. Let's have a quick comment from Jay Brown at the back on tax. Well, I'd like to ask Alistair that... Um, well, just make a comment if you would, because I want to move okay, on. Okay, well, Labour have so far talked a good fight, but uh, I'm still not convinced that you can actually be trusted as a party. All right, I want to go to Len Wilson now. Uh, Len, you have a question about trade unions. Yes, I have. I, I, as a previous member of a, a union, having worked in British Steel, um, I'd like to see every working person have the right to be in a trade union, uh, as is their right in, in Europe. How do you feel about that? And, and, and what about if the majority of a company, of workers in a company, vote to have a union? What do you say about that? I feel they should have one. And should the company be forced to recognise them? I believe so, yes. You, I believe you want it right, compulsory. It's the right of a person to have that Malcolm union. Malcolm Bruce, now, uh, do you agree with that? I mean, in your manifesto, you say you support the social chapter, which is about this sort of thing. Well, we certainly do believe that now that we've got much more democratic trade unions, and the Liberal Democrats played a significant part in securing that uh, uh, reform, then really it ought to be possible for trade unions to play a fuller role and management benefit from that as well. But I think people also have the right not to belong to a union if that suits them. And I don't think we want to return to the bad old days of the closed shop. Recognition seems legitimate, but not compulsion. What is uh, wrong with the idea of workers voting uh, a majority and having recognition? They're not asking the company to pay them money, they just want to be recognised for the I, right to I bargain. I think the idea of having the kind of legal imposition of trade unions is wrong. One of the things that our legislation has done is to enable good relationships to be developed between management and employees without the need for this kind of legal framework. That's why we've got now one of the most successful flexible economies. That's why we're number one for inward investment because people know that it's good management practice, good labour relations. The question raises an interesting Is it always issue. good labour relations if a management doesn't bargain? I mean, most European companies, most big multinationals bargain with trade unions. Does it necessarily follow that it's good management practice when you don't bargain? Well, all I would say is in terms of the way that we have management uh, labour union relations now, we're in an economy which is falling in terms of 
unemployment. In places like France and Germany, where the kind of model that Labour want to introduce is there, unemployment is rising. Colin Brown, you're, uh, of course, the managing director of the company. You welcome this with open arms, do you? S certainly not. Uh, our but companies... if the majority of your, of, your, of your employees said we'd like to you to recognise a trade union, you're a good employer, you would? I think our company um, must maintain its uh, ability to make its own decision as to whether to recognise a union or not. I think it's of paramount importance that the company is in control of its um, marketing st um, policies and its labour policies. Um, th what concerns me most of all is the fact that we're going through a period uh, at present of union silence. That is most unusual in a build-up to a general election. What guarantees can the Labour Party offer me as an employer that we are not going to be faced back with the periods of the 1970s. Well, I'll give you a guarantee there's no question of going back to the 1970s. <coughs> Nobody wants to do that at all. The other guarantee I'll give you, and unlike the Tory party, uh, we have set out in our manifesto on this and in other areas precisely what we intend to do, and we intend to honour those commitments because <coughs> I think the restoration of trust between the electorate and political parties is a very good thing. Coming directly to the point you raise, of course it's the case that in every single company, people work best where management and workforce are actually engaged and committed to the same enterprise. But Alistair, and Collins made the point, here's a successful company who's made it through the recession, who works in a deprived area and has forced its way to the top. He's giving you advice and said, let me do it my way, but you're saying, no, no I'll no, compel no, you. I, I'm, not saying, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that at all. There are many, many companies, as I, as I said at the outset, have done exceptionally well, and when they do well, it, you tend to find that management and the workforce are all engaged and committed in the same enterprise. There's no dispute between them. What we're saying, though, is clearly if the workforce choose and vote, uh, the majority uh, of the workforce want to be in a trade union, then it seems reasonable, and it actually works throughout the rest of the world very well. Okay. Uh, that they ought to be recognised. But, you know, there's no question of, you know, if the Michael Jack was going on about Don't the reason the for unemployment falling. It's you know, unemployment in, num in terms of the number of workless households in this country is actually higher than it is in France and Germany. All right, let's go to Nick Sternick. You have a particular problem about unionisation, casualisation, which I want Michael Jack to answer. Um, worried about the increased <coughs> casualization of the job uh, market. There are so many casual workers uh, that have uh, short-term contracts and some of them have no job protection or rights at all. Uh, is it right to have an economy <coughs> based to a large extent, <coughs> a large section of the economy on casual and part-time workers? And well, what can you say to me? I think if you look in the last year, you'll find that 232,000 additional people are back in the labour force. The majority of those are actually full-time jobs. What we created in this country, though, is a much more flexible labour force. And it's very interesting. I was in business before I came into Parliament. Uh, I think certainly listening to the Labour front bench team from the <coughs> Treasury side, none of them have effectively ever taken a business decision. What they know and understand, what they don't understand, is that you do need flexibility. And that's what I think the flexible labour force... What about those at the, at the bottom of the heap? No, the point is that by having flexibility, it gives <coughs> employers the opportunity to take labour on when they need it, to then let those people go into other jobs. Flexibility has benefited our economy. All right, flexibility for employees too, Michael? Flexibility for employees, certainly, because it does mean that there are more opportunities being created in different sections of the economy to which workers can move okay. on occasion. Let's move on. Liam Graham? Yes. I'd just like to say, I believe in the minimum wage, but it should be reasonable. I think about £5 should be reasonable. You think there should be wage. a minimum wage of £5 yeah. pounds an hour? Why? Well, the money that's going about now, it's uh, not enough to live on. You have to do... What, 60 hours to make a decent wage? All right, let's take a quick comment from three comments. First, Mark and Bruce. Well, I think what, what the discussion we're just having at the moment explains why there isn't a strong feel-good factor. And what the Conservatives call flexibility for many people is exploitation. Stay with the minimum wage. Well, no, but time. I think that's the background. What people are saying is that we need security in our jobs and we need a reasonable wage. I have to say that a £5 minimum wage is not something that would, would work because it would destroy jobs. What we do need is to create a viable economy where companies can afford to pay more okay. and give people more job yeah. security. Statutory minimum wage. Yes, um, I think a min minimum wage uh, is absolutely essential. It's uh, about fairness, but it also ends the scandal. Where Five pounds the, an hour? The, the actual rate. thing is, you the, promised three no, pounds forty an hour no, in 1992 the, the, last time. The, act, the actual rate that the actual rate 
at which it is introduced has to be uh, a matter of discussion because it has to be introduced. Didn't say that last time, well, Alistair. I'm telling you, we're fighting this election in 1997. I understand. And, uh, you know, the, no, just wait, you hold on a minute. Uh, you, you did answer that. You did ask the question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. The rate at which it is fixed has to be reasonable in the circumstances. But the point I was making is that the taxpayers are spending £3 billion a year now subsidising low wages, and that can't be good for any of us. Exactly the point. You the have a minimum wage, wage it's, called, it's yeah. called income support. Now, the job, it's a job destroyer. Right. A million jobs will it go. Labour's own researches on the minimum wage show that even at £3.70 an hour, people would only be 7p uh, a, a, an hour better off because of the interaction with the benefit this system. True. And Alistair knows that well, it's really another way of true. providing a but tax milch cow. But this company job, knows what, what to pay its workers. Uh, the minimum uh, wage few, kills the, jobs. A few quick comments at the end. Mark Martin Clegg. You don't have well, I, I, it does work in America. I've worked both sides of the Atlantic and it does work. It depends on where it's levelled at and the type of labour force that you're employing. But it does work. Eamon McGinley. Minimum wage. How much? In my, for me personally, I'd be looking in the region of excess of five pound an hour. Uh, Maddie. Well, I think the whole of the the um, economy of the company has to be able to pay that, and certainly we would like to be able to pay what is a fair wage for the for that yeah. job, and to be able to increase that yeah. as the company. Grows. I have one last question for you all, and that is, as a result of coming here today. As a result of listening to the program, talking to the politicians, have any of you moved your position in the position you had before, either from don't know to a positive vote or from a positive vote to don't know? Hands up, any of you has changed their mind when the, as a result of coming here? Nobody. How many of you still don't know? Hands up, those who still don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there you are. You're available for the politicians to try and uh, capture your votes. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you from the people of Python Products, Premier Python Products. Thank you very much to our three politicians for coming. Uh, Alistair Darling, Michael Jack, and Malcolm Bruce. And that's about all from This Week in Politics. Join us again next Saturday. In the meantime, you can keep up with election gossip every weekday on Midnight Special and join me on Channel 4's political quiz, Spot the Difference, on Wednesday at 8. And if you are struggling to spot any differences, you can phone 0171 485 5485 to join the audience for Voters Can't Be Choosers. From Vincent to me and all of us here, a very good evening. <laughs>